Hofton, you can go ahead. Thank you for that, uh, Livato. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Helftan Lüng, and I'm a senior lecturer at the Witt School of Governance. On behalf of the head of school, Professor Mtsukizi Ngopo, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar on women in the fourth industrial revolution. Welcome to the speakers, um, welcome to the moderator, and welcome to the audience who will be following this conversation live on Zoom and on uh, Facebook, or will be watching the recording afterwards on the WSG uh, YouTube channel. It's somehow ironic uh, that I'm sitting here as a man uh, welcoming you to a webinar on, on women in the fourth industrial revolution. I'd much rather be sitting in the audience uh, listening to the conversation, but uh, this was the task I have, be I have been given, so I, I hope you will bear with me. Um, I'm not going to say much. Um, it's been five years now since uh, Klaus Schwab published his book, The Fourth Industrial Revolution in which he popularized the idea that automation uh, through large-scale deployment of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence represents a revolution in the same way that mechanization, electrification, and digitization already did. Um, in his book, uh, Klaus Schwab uh, dedicated two chapters to society and the individual where he discussed issues around uh, income inequality, uh, the middle class, democracy, voting, diversity, uh, polarization, among many other things. Gender inequality and women uh, are not mentioned at all, uh, not even in passing. Um, and I know this because I actually reviewed the chapters this morning. All this to say that I think the topic of today's conversation is extremely timely and extremely important. We know that economic shocks affect men and women differently. Uh, and it's absolutely crucial that we start reflecting on how uh, the fourth industrial revolution will affect women in the economy and in society at large. I'll stop here and hand over to the moderator, uh, Professor Glenda Daniels. Professor Daniels is an associate professor in the media studies department at Wits University. She has a PhD in political studies and is a media, media freedom and diversity activist. Professor Daniels is the author of several books and is also a rated scholar with the National Research Foundation. She chaired the diversity and ethics subcommittee at the South African National Editors Forum until 2020 and now serves on its council. She's also the executive of, uh, on the executive of the South African Communication Association on the board of the Press Council of South Africa, and she's an editorial advisory board member at Journalism Studies. She was a journalist in the print media industry for over two decades. Her research interests and activist activities are media and politics, state of the newsroom, democracy theory, the role of the media in democracy, freedom of expression, and cyber misogyny. Finally, she's also a Media Matters columnist at Daily Maverick. Professor Daniels, thank you for being with us and thank you for agreeing to, to moderate this webinar. I'll hand over, to, hand over to you then. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hafta. That sounds like a very fancy introduction. Thank you very much to the Wits School of Governance for inviting me to moderate this. So the Wits School of Governance framing for this is that as the fourth industrial revolution continues to advance in South Africa and Africa as a whole, we are faced with a widening gender gap. With women facing exclusion due to issues of little or no digital literacy, exposure and access. This gap means that fewer women will be able to compete, let alone participate in this digital revolution. So the question is, how can we set women to take up space in science and technology to become leaders, pioneers and change makers in Africa's fourth industrial revolution? These are some of the questions in my mind. These are some of the issues that I think and I hope and I'm sure the panelists, the esteemed panelists that we have today, which I will introduce you to in a minute, will talk about access to education 
And then we have to ask what subjects are taken. Is maths on our maths and science and technology important to encourage girls towards? Is this happening? What about access to funding? Are boys still privileged in households to get the bigger share of who gets educated? Access to broadband. Once women have this, they need digital literacy. Government and private sectors, should they be investing? And if they are not investing, of course they should be investing. Why aren't they? And when you are in there on that first step on the ladder, what are the block blockages? What are the anti-feminist backlashes that we experience as women? For example, a gender pay, a pay gap. So let's hear from the women who have battled these obstacles. How did they get there and how can they inspire us? Our first panelist, so we have, um, we have a woman uh, from, from South Africa, Nalavuyo Nkado. Then we have Professor Neki Geki Karuri Sabina. And we have Linda Ansung from Ghana. So I'll introduce the first panelist. Um, and then I'll, yeah, I'll actually introduce all the panelists and each of them will speak for 10 minutes. And thereafter, we will have a question and answer session. Nola Vuyo is an award-winning technology professional. She was one of the Mail and Guardian's Young 200 Professionals in 2021 and one of the inspiring 50 women in STEM in 2019 in South Africa. Nolu is a founder of Code and Guano, which teaches children from disadvantaged areas on how to code. She has also written stories about technology for kids and has published three books, including a coding encyclopedia that has been translated into Isikosa and Satsana. Nalu is involved in numerous initiatives that close the digital divide. Most recently, she helped translate the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the financial services sector, institution of higher learning and mining industry. She holds a BCom Honours Degree in Information Systems from the University of Cape Town, along with various industry certifications and management qualifications. She is also a mentor at the Miller Centre of Social Entrepreneurship at Santa Clara University in Silicon Valley. Through her work in Santa Clara University, she contributes to the food security space in Nigeria and early childhood development in Kenya, where she mentors organizations and helps them scale. Nalu is also a board member for Waves of Change, which teaches surf therapy to kids, and a board member of EdTech Global, a nonprofit focused on teacher development through technology. Nalu is a firm believer and advocate for digital inclusion. She is also a mother who loves art and traveling. She believes children are natural problem solvers as their minds are uncorrupted. Fantastic. When they are empowered, a new world of possibilities is possible. Fantastic. So our next, for the next panelist is uh, Dr. Keki, Keki Karuri Sabina. Keki is a scholar practitioner based in Johannesburg working in the intersection between people, place, and technological change. She is a visiting associate professor at the Witt School of Governance, from where she is coordinating the Civic Tech Innovation Network. She is also associated with UCT's African Center for Cities and Southern Africa and South African Cities Innovation Systems and Digital Governance in Africa. Geki is mostly busy being a family person, friend to many, and a music lover. Then from Ghana is Linda Ansong, who is a social entrepreneur. She is the co-founder and executive director at STEMBees organization, which is a nonprofit that aims at empowering young African women in STEM to bridge the existing gender gap. She also co-founded Vestracker, a software company serving the freight industry, and is a director of international strategy at Planet Startup, a nonprofit aimed at alleviating poverty through entrepreneurship. 
Linda is not only known for her work in technology, she is also the first and only female CEO of a Premier Division football club. It's very good for us to be breaking the stereotypes of what we can be in and what we can't be in. There should be nothing that women can't be in. So Liberty Professionals FC in Ghana and the first woman to be voted treasury of the Ghana League Clubs Association. She has a background in actuarial science and software entrepreneurship. In her free time, you can find her dancing Kizomba at her favorite dance club. So welcome to the three of you who are going to be speaking for 10 minutes each from now. And could we please start with Nolly? Thanks so much. Over to you, Nolly. Greetings, everyone. Is my sound clear? It's very clear. Please proceed. Thanks, Nolly. So my name is Nolu Badu. My background or entry into uh, the technology space uh, was uh, in the late uh, 2000s. I worked uh, for one of the largest telecoms uh, company in South Africa. And what's interesting uh, for me when we talk about women uh, in the fourth IR or what is a woman in tech is often uh, the uh, preconceived ideas that uh, we think a woman in tech or a woman in STEM needs to, needs to hold a glorified title. So my entry into, into the in industry or the field uh, was quite interesting because I started off uh, as a call center agent and many people uh, would not unnecessarily include you into the table if you if you start uh, as a call center agent because what do you know about technology what do you have to contribute so i worked uh, my way up uh, fulfilling various roles uh, within within the technology space and one of the challenges uh, that i experienced with uh, within uh, working my way up as a woman uh, within the technology space is is around being in a space with people who don't necessarily look like me in terms of gender. I was often the only female in the room uh, back in the days. Also being in a space where in terms of color as well, uh, people don't necessarily look like you. Uh, I was often in very white dominated spaces where people think differently and some of the challenges that uh, I have experienced, I'm gonna draw from my own lesson, some of the experiences that I have uh, sort of experienced uh, as I was navigating my, my journey into, into a career in tech is uh, being able to, to be comfortable in, uh, in raising a voice, in uh, contributing when uh when we we don't think uh when we don't think the same and when we we don't think uh, alike so i fulfilled uh, a couple of technical roles uh from uh support roles to business analysis roles to project management roles i've managed uh, various uh, software development uh projects and i think uh it is quite crucial to have uh, different voices uh, represented as we build uh, various systems in businesses. Because it is said that women occupy most consumer decisions. Yet when uh, businesses are building uh, solutions, I, I look at my journey when I worked in, in the banks, when banks build uh, systems, uh, you find that the representation of, uh, of women in building these uh, this systems, the this solution is, uh, is not much, yet uh, women will be consuming uh, most of uh, these products. So it has been a privilege to, uh, to be involved in such, uh, in such spaces and in such uh, projects. One of the challenges that um, I experienced uh, also as a woman, uh, in the fourth IR or the women in tech is also around uh, the gaps that uh, people don't often uh, want to, uh, to talk about. For example, I would look around my peers uh, when I worked uh, for one of the financial service companies uh, and looked uh, at the lifestyle that they were living. They were mainly guys. And I'd ask myself, uh, 
Are we doing the same thing? Do we have the same job? Why our, our lifestyles are, are so different? And uh, it, took me, it took me a while to, uh, to be able to, to be confident and, uh, and start having uh, difficult uh, conversations around uh, money as a woman in tech. Uh, many times we would need to, to give uh, what you call this without taking much time. We would need, uh, we would need to put in long, long hours. And I know when I started my family in my early 20s, I would, uh, I would feel bad about, uh, about pushing back uh, on certain things, saying, no, I can't stay, uh, I can't stay up late. I've got, uh, I've got commitments to do. It takes a lot of time. And I think it's important for women who are currently occupying uh, spaces uh, within uh, the fourth IR space and technology to uh, to create an environment that is welcoming uh, to other women as well. And our duty as women within uh, the fourth IR, fourth IR space uh, is not just to sit there and hold and hold uh, glorified positions, but our duty is to, is to firmly go for what we believe in. And uh, through being a woman in, in tech, I was able to sort of find my voice in, uh, in wanting inclusion for for the uh, for the for the ones that aren't included because I spent a lot of time not being included, so it uh, motivated me to start the work that I'm doing with kids, uh, particularly disadvantaged kids, and how I'm including them in terms of teaching them how to code, exposing them to uh, technology at a young age, and I think uh, as women within the fourth IR or within technology spaces, we have uh, the power to drive success, to be successful if we are committed uh, to a cause. It can be quite a lonely industry. Uh, the fact that uh, it's, not, uh, it's not friendly for, uh, for women, but I, I'm proud to say things are changing. It's not as bad as it used to be. It is uh, definitely uh, more welcoming to women but one of the challenges that I still uh, I still do see uh, is that women don't often stay long uh, in in the tech spaces, and those are some of the conversations that I, I want us to sort of have uh, today, because I know at some point in my career as well I I, I got uh, into a point where, where I was like uh, I don't think this is for me, I want uh, to uh, to walk away or to try something new. So those are the conversations that I'm looking forward to uh, to having with the fellow panel today. Thank you very much, Nolly. Uh, you raised some very interesting points which we can have a discussion around um, after we hear the next two panelists. And um, in fact, you know, you've raised some of the issues of people in the space who don't look like you. That's immediately alienating. So it's a double, it's a triple struggle. Uh, that's the issue of race and gender. Then you raise the issue of the gender pay gap, why other people are having different lifestyles. It's, a, it's an uncomfortable, stereotypically uncomfortable conversation for women to have, but we are talking about it more and more. And the inspiring positive bit that I take away from you is the fact that you say things are changing, even if it's slow, things are changing. We are getting more women into that space. Um, thank you. Please, can we have uh, Geki next, who is from Kenya and who's based in South Africa, but we would love to hear how she managed to do what she's done and what are the battles she's faced and how she thinks we can overcome these, what kind of inspiring messages we can have for women to, to enter the throes of where we do not dominate and we want to be equals. Thank you. Thank you, Glenda, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to have this conversation uh, and maybe in part because of my own story, and I'll start there. Um, I started off many, many years ago now uh, studying computer science. And um, even back into those days of study and then as a young professional working on issues of technology and the built environment, um, I was almost always in environments where there were very few women around me. So I was really in male spaces. And I realized that over time I became accustomed to that. 
uh, and they got to accepting the battles that go with that. Uh, and so perhaps I want to start my intervention by just saying that and acknowledging that that shouldn't be. And I often say to people, just because I'm a female in this space doesn't mean I'm an expert on gender issues in this space, because sometimes I feel most ill-equipped actually to observe these things because I got used to them. I got used to them. Uh, and so my big takeaway from that is that we all, men and women, uh, need to be a lot more conscious about who is not in the room. We need to constantly ask why, and we need to constantly seek to address that. And, and this is not a numeric issue. It's not a math issue. Uh, it's really about being very conscious about what we are trying to do, particularly in spaces of knowledge building, spaces of development, uh, spaces where we think we're driving any kind of societal value. Uh, I, I think um, there's a real need to be introspective about uh, uh, the fact that these spaces continue to be very uh, uh, male dominated. Um, I thought what I would lead with today is that um, I, I work with something, as Glenda said, called the Civic Tech Innovation Network, which is an African network of people working in this sort of civic tech, tech for good space. Uh, and a few months ago in April, we actually ran a, a podcast series on women in tech. Uh, it was on the one hand, I find very inspiring, but it was also a very harsh reminder of, of how much still needs to be done in this space. And I, I thought I'd use this opportunity to bring the voices of those women uh, into this conversation a little bit with some of the key points that came from that. Uh, one of the things that they almost uniformly referred, and these were four different sessions, to was the access to technology and digital literacy still being very low, certainly in South Africa, almost certainly across the continent. Uh, and the point is that when access is low, this means that it's almost impossible uh, for women who tend to be, you know, the harder, you know, the, the worst off, if you want, of the bunch uh, to participate in online digital communities and any idea of digital economy, any idea of digital learning, uh, uh, women systematically get excluded from that. Um, many of them referred to the fact that the COVID experience has really accentuated that very clearly, like really brought to light the extent of this digital divide, really amplifying this issue that many of them have been raising over time. So Baratang Mia, who is the co-founder of Girl Hikes, uh, really made this point that uh, the tech space has not been inclusive, has not been conducive, and particularly the issues of access have not been addressed seriously. The second point that uh, many of the women made was that the tech space, and, and this was across commercial as well as uh, sort of social, I would say, spaces, continues to be male dominated uh, and unwelcoming for women is the kind of language they used. And this really bothered me because, you know, in 1994, when I was participating in coding competitions, uh, this was mainly in the US, uh, and I was always either the only woman or one of very, very few women, like literally it could be one or two of us. Um, and I thought that was an issue then, and that's in the developed North. Um, it looks like very little has changed now, all these years later, that we continue to have these spaces that are, yeah, could literally be rooms full of men. And I've seen those, I, I sit sometimes in those rooms full of men. Uh, I think that's something we really need to take on and make sense of. Uh, I asked our team at CTIN to just look through our databases and see what they could discern of it in terms of uh, the participation of women in the civic tech space. And of the 180 initiatives that we've captured so far, at least in Africa, it looked like only about 20 of those uh, appeared to be focused on gender issues, and that's only one dimension. But it also looked like maybe not much more than that, if you could even tell, uh, perhaps had female founders or, or much female involvement. Uh, ironically, Halfden can tell us more about this in, in due time because he's busy really helping us interrogate this data. But um, it, it's clear that even in a social civic activist, sort of you'd assume more conscious space, uh, we still have this skew where things really seem, even in the younger generation, to very much be male-driven spaces and it tends to be males first. Now, I, like I said, for me, it's not a numeric issue. It's not just about counting how many males are there. For me, the question is about counting how many females are not there. And this is something we have to really ask and be very conscious of. The third point many of the women emphasized is that while there are initiatives like Femtech, like Linda Marsley, like Girl Hikes, that are really working to close the digital gap, it's tough work, it's tough work, it's uphill work, and we're really hoping to have a massive change in this space. Uh, and people like uh, Zine and Kwana are telling us we need to because you know, it really doesn't look encouraging in terms of the extent to which women are coming up in the spaces. Uh, then we need to see a lot more, both in female development, but also in coaching and mentoring uh, and really deliberate support 
to women as entrepreneurs in the social or commercial spaces, women as activists, women as civic leaders uh, who should not be left behind as digital transformation unfolds. So I think I'll stop with that, um, uh, uh, Prof. Lenda, just to say that uh, happy to be here, but in a way not happy to be discussing something that I think we should have made a lot more progress with, at least in my last 20 years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gerki. That was uh, that was also very interesting because what you've actually said is one gets so used to being in male dominated spaces that often one doesn't have the consciousness until one does to say who is not in the room. Um, and also what Nalu said earlier about inclusion, it's about remembering to bring in people and remembering that so it's okay if you're there, but you know, we need to remember who's not there and bring them in and starting with kids. And the important takeaway from you, Geki, that I got was, in fact, there are many initiatives in Africa, you know, um, there are loads of initiatives, but there isn't that follow through. There isn't the follow through in terms of seeing why are people failing? Why do they drop out of the space? How can we bring them back in? What about the coaching and mentoring aspect? It's terribly important. It's the same, you know, the, it's, it's the, an issue with the digital divide itself, with the haves and the have nots. I have this equipment, what do I do with it? How can I use it? And people need that kind of digital literacy. Thank you very much. Can we please have our next speaker, which is Linda, who has also broken many stereotypes, as I read to you earlier. And she's going to tell us about how she's done it, what battles she's faced, and what she can share with other women and other people about how to make our world a more just place. Because the moment we have justice for women, we have a more just world. Thank you. Over to you, Linda. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So I'm Linda Ansel. Um, I'm the co-founder of Stanley's. Um, as um, Professor Glender um, read, I have a background in actuarial science and software entrepreneurship. So um, I think most women who find themselves in these industries usually find themselves to be one of few, if not only, women in, in the group or in the class and all that. So um, when I was doing my actuarial science um, studies, I realized I was one of few. I, I brushed over it, complained a little bit, and then moved on. Um, when I was doing my course in software entrepreneurship, I realized we were even fewer. We were just four girls or four ladies in a class of over 100. So then I, I asked myself, why is this the problem? Is it that we are not good enough? Which I answered for myself immediately because I know I'm good enough and I know that there are other women who are as smart, even if not smarter, who can do this and do it very well. So then I started asking questions. I, I asked around, found out some young girls, I just asked them, what do they think about technology? What they thought about math? What they thought about science? And the answers I was getting was, mostly they thought it wasn't for them. They thought it was for men, um, because that is the stereotype. And even if you were a woman and you wanted to venture into it, you had to look a certain way, or you had to behave in a certain way. You had to be a geek or a tomboy or something to be able to fit in that industry. So our journey as STEMBs is not just about training, but basically demystifying what STEM is and the kind of woman or kind of person you need to be to be successful in that industry. Um, there is a lot, there is a lot of um, problems that we face especially in Ghana. I mean, imagine yourself trying to teach a girl software development when she has never seen a computer before, when she doesn't know what a keyboard is. So we have the challenge of having to teach from the very basic and building on that gradually to some point as say robotics or um, software development or artificial intelligence or internet of things. So it hasn't been an easy journey, um, but that, that, that brings the question, who is responsible for making these um, informations or these um, resources available to these kids? Um, do we blame the government? Do we blame 
the businesses. But um, I think we all have a role to play. We, as the government, um, there's the need to update the curriculum that is being taught in schools, especially basic schools and high schools, because it's based on that that we build to be these um, tech um, entrepreneurs or tech professionals. Um, it is very sad, I can tell you for a fact, that the curriculum being taught in Ghana right now doesn't have a definite STEM inclusion. Um, the only science or technology um, topic being taught is identifying the parts of a computer. So imagine moving from that and then all of a sudden being introduced to software um, application or robotics. It is a huge um, learning curve. But it's not too late, I believe. I believe that we can start one person at a time. And that is why I started Stanley's with my, my two female colleagues, um, Angela and Lady Omega. So the, the whole dream is that together we can train one girl at a time, because I believe if you train one girl, she's definitely going to train others, at least three others. And in that, in that um, vein, we get to reach out to as many girls as possible. But um, as the women who are in this industry, what are we also doing to make sure that we, we motivate the, the younger girls who want to come into this industry? One thing I've realized is we are not most of the time mentors. We, we, are, we are lost in our space. And I know it's busy, it's hectic, trying to even deal with the, the biases that we face every day and the pushbacks in the industry. It's difficult to make time to also mentor someone who is coming up. But I think um, if we do put aside some time to help one girl, just motivate the girl, let her know that it's not easy. It, should, it doesn't have to be easy. I don't think anything good comes easy. But I mean, if you put in the work, if you are willing to fight, um, I'm sure um, the two previous um, um, ladies spoke about the, the biases and being the only person and, and the pushback. Definitely, I walk into a room and someone asks me, where is, where is your, your partner or who are you? are you? Are you the one coming to talk about this? Or are you the one coming to introduce the software? They expect a guy. And, and sometimes we have, I, if I tell you some of the remarks that, the, the remarks that I've heard, from, from people when they found out I was the person coming to talk about this or that in STEM. It, it's it's mind-blowing, sexist, rude, mean, but um, I don't get used to it. But I, I speak up, I tell them my peace of mind and I, I let them know I deserve to be here, not because I am a woman, because I am qualified to be here and I know what I'm talking about. So that also brings me to my point of mediocrity. Um, we shouldn't want to just be in a room to fill a quota, because I feel sometimes pushing this agenda of female equality and equity and all that, we sometimes um, push some kind of mediocrity because we are trying to fill a quota. I believe that if there's a room for a woman on a table, and you are given that opportunity, I think you should do it 110% because you're not just representing yourself, but you're representing other women who, are, who haven't been given that opportunity, who will probably be given the opportunity if you kill it at that um, table. So the, the point is we women need to be at the table because as um, Nolu said, these um, solutions are being built for everybody, including women. But women are not involved in the solution, um, in, the, in, in coming up with a solution. And that is the problem. We all know that when it comes to critical reasoning, creativity, and emotional intelligence, women are, let's be honest, better than men, right? So let's build on that. We have the creativity. We have the critical reasoning. And we know that before a problem can be solved, the problem has to be thought through. There should be a solution before anything can be built. And that is where we come in. Let, let's build on what we are good at. Let's be better at it. Let's be noted for it. So that at the end of the day, when we are called to a table, we will be seen for who we are. And that would open doors for more women to be called to the table. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. That was fantastic. 
of course we have to be at the table and of course we have to make more space for other women to be at the table and what i got from what linda was saying is that we never think we are not good enough because of course we are good enough and we are better in so many ways fantastic and um you know and the point that you made also about even if it's helping one girl we are all so busy everyone is so busy that we we don't have time for mentorship and coaching but the rewards that come with actually doing it <coughs> is, fan is also amazing you know we actually feel better and feel good about ourselves as well as helping somebody else when we actually do it the other important point that Linda made was the importance of speaking out, calling it out. Every time we, it's exhausting, of course it's exhausting, but we have to do it because we have to do it. We have to call out sexism and we have to call out stereotyping and we have to call out the biases when, as soon as we see them. And uh, so that there's some kind of consciousness raising in the process, it does happen. All right, thanks guys. Um, thanks women, powerful women. What we're now going to do is go into the comments chat room to see what questions there are. At the moment, there aren't questions, there are comments. And I'll just tell you what the comments are so we can discuss and hopefully there will be questions to the panelists. Wesley Naidu says, there's a need for guidance for young women to understand that this industry, meaning the tech industry, is not just for men and not for people to be intimidated by any means to enter into the world of technology. So we need as women to let other women know that there's no space that is not for them. And then from Facebook, Jean Vincent says, the truth is that poverty and wealth distribution remains the main problem of the South African economy. The digital revolution and the so-called gender gap promoted is a bit, uh, a bit of nonsense. We are talking about a gap in terms even more among races and men. The powerless government is the main cause of this mess. The real gender gap is the inability of women to be politically conscious of what is at stake and to be sufficiently politically aware. Well, I'm sure that's one issue, but the other issue is that there's a huge gender gap as well. And of course, when we talk about the digital divide, we are talking about the intersections, the cross-cutting intersections of race, class and gender, and who are the ones that end up being at the bottom of the path. Uh, what are the other comments here? Uh, oh, it's Jean Vincent saying the South African economy is not enough democratic to talk about a digital revolution. We are talking about pre-existing conditions of inequality at risk to increase nothing more. Um, Yvonne Lashaba says we have an echo. Wesley Naidu says, love the passion and determination coming across. Thank you, Wesley. And um, Geki, would you like to respond? You, you are saying something here? Uh, sure, Glenda. I was just responding to Les Wesley, who it turns out is not Wesley, but is Christine Wood. Thank you, Christine, for uh, confirming uh, or clarifying. Uh, and I was just saying that, yes, I do agree that uh, intimidation even if it may not seem deliberate, I think is a condition that many women face. And I think some of that is made worse sometimes by the jargon and the kind of, we try to make tech seem so confound. I mean, think, think what is 4IR? We use this term and it, it sort of serves sometimes to make people feel like they don't understand what we're talking about. It's not something for them. I've heard so many female friends of mine say, oh, maybe they need to take a coding class so they can participate in these conversations. And when I have to go through that process of explaining that it's not about learning coding. <laughs> you know, that's not what the digital transformation is necessarily about. And that's not the only way you participate in the space. So I do think we have to deal with some of these issues uh, and make them a bit less opaque, uh, a little bit less complicated, uh, because I think that in itself sometimes is used actively as a form of exclusion. Thank you, Geki. Yes, I think that's an important point. Uh, Nalu wants to also respond. Nalu, can we have you, please? 
And another point I forgot to mention as I was narrating uh, is that you'll step into these spaces and uh, you will feel that you are made uh, you are made uncomfortable, or sometimes people will deliberately make you uncomfortable because uh, you look different uh, to them. So it's some of uh, the challenges that uh, we need uh, to navigate. In in addition to what Prof has mentioned around uh, around jargon, sometimes it's uh, it's deliberate. It's to test you. And no woman should uh, go through any of those experiences. It's some of the stereotypes uh, that uh, we need to address, some of the things that we need to call on on, day on daily basis. It's the unconscious bias and some of the behavior that, happen, uh, in th that happens in these spaces. You'll step, for example, into a meeting room. I would get into a meeting room where it's all men and uh, one would request, can you make us uh, uh, coffee or tea? So it's those things that will uh, that will get to you, but if you don't address it and say no, I will not be making you tea. You will uh, you will be fulfilling that stereotype that uh, we've got a woman uh, in the room, therefore she uh, she should be taking care of us. Not that I mind, but it shouldn't be enforced. So I will make uh, tea for for my fellow colleagues, but it shouldn't be it shouldn't be forced uh, from a gender perspective that you are. You are female, therefore, if there's no tea in a meeting, it's your role to uh, to go in, uh, and arrange tea. Absolutely. And calling it out and not doing it or making a once off comment such as, do you see I make the tea on my T-shirt or something rude because we are constantly faced with rudeness and we are constantly faced with insensitivities and bias and we are too polite to call it out then and there. Thanks for that noting that comment. Um, is there anyone else on the panel who wants to address anything else that they've forgotten to address? But uh, let's have a look at the comments in the chat. How people are still asking us for coffee and tea, says Geki. Exactly. So, you know, we've got, we, put, we go two steps for, forward and we get to go three steps backwards. But in fact, you know, Progress is being made because there's more consciousness and there's more awareness of what sexism is than there was 10 years ago and even 20 years ago, even though people can't let it go. They do know that they're being sexist, actually, a lot of the time. Subconscious bias, uh, conscious bias, a lot of people are actually aware of it um, because we're calling it out. Okay, can I have any other comment or any other question that I'm missing from the audiences? We've got about 42 participants on the group. Does anyone from the audience want to make a comment? You don't have to ask a question. You can just uh, raise your hand and I'll, you can unmute yourself and say something to any of the guests or make a comment about the theme that we're talking through in the first place. Uh, one of the panelists has got their hands up. Uh, oh, one of the attendees. Okay, can we have Wesley who wants to speak? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, very well, thanks. Hi, it's Christine. Sorry, it's Christine. Wesley. Oh booked the session for me so i'm sure it keeps coming up in his name great um, yeah, yeah i think it's very important that people that do i mean for me i've gotten over the tea and coffee ask for quite a while because i'll already say you know you're more than capable of doing it but um i do believe that you are only intimidated as, lo as long as you allow somebody to do so if you politely and and, and, and step in on a professional level and say something they'll kind of look at you twice and then they'll think, okay, let's not go there with this particular person. And um, you have to exude that confidence and that ability within those sessions because men do that. Um, you know, you, you often feel that when you're sitting in an important board meeting or sitting in an, an important exco session, they'll swear and they'll do their thing. And then women feel the need to have to fit in to that scenario unless you speak up but you have to have the confidence to do so. It's difficult when you're young and you enter the business because you don't want to, you know, come across as uh, somebody who thinks they know everything. 
but um, as I said earlier, also bringing young women into this environment, they they already believe that it's a man's world, like the speaker previously said. They can be intimidated because they don't necessarily understand that it isn't just for men. And um, us as women have to boost those youngsters and those females into the position and take them in and mentor them and coach them to take them forward. People with strong personalities, strong confidence levels. So coaching and mentoring is required and a lot of encouragement. Yes, That's... Thank, you. thank you very much, Christine. That's uh, well said. And it's also, as you would know, it's exhausting, you know, to be always doing it. It's exhausting. You know, it would be easier if it was a more, if it was a better world and a more non, a non sexist world. But, uh, and sometimes women tell me they, they feel up to it. And sometimes they don't because it's just hard to be doing it on a daily basis. But uh, that's an important point to just gain that confidence and obviously it sometimes comes with age it sometimes comes with experience and it also comes with achievements um you know you gain more confidence as you uh, you feel then i'm able to is uh, says in my experience once you set your mind on a specific goal there will be those who join you on that journey who will assist you in conquering the challenges you'll come across. There are a lot of reasons why things are so difficult for us females, which vary from female to female, but a lot of females that have made it in these spaces were strong enough to overcome. Um, question from Kamantha. Any suggestions? She's asking the panelists now, anyone or all three of you can answer. Any suggestions or advice on how to get young girls interested in tech at a school level? Any program? Sorry if I missed it. Did Nalo speak about her books? Okay, I'll hand it over to who on the, oh, maybe there's another question here also on the chat, which we can do at the same time. Oh, Mohadi Chabalala and Ivan Lechaba, can you speak? You've got your hands raised and then the speakers, the panelists will take your comments and your questions. So um, talking permitted to YL. Hello, hello, colleagues. Hello. Am I audible? Hello, Yvonne. Yes, you are. Please go ahead with your question or comment. First, it's a comment, uh, then a question will follow. The first comment is to appreciate this platform and um, this uh, safe space, if I can say, because it's not only a platform, it's also a, a safe space that provides us with an opportunity to can engage as as, as as people. Um, the process will take time. Remember, we are addressing issues whereby people were socialized into believing it's not for them, but for others for many years. So it, it, it's also about mentoring, yes, but where? It's also about mentoring, yes, but who? And the, 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 my, my, my biggest challenge is, yes, we, we need to mentor, we need to encourage, but do we also uh, zoom into areas where we need to be focusing on to touch, to, to try and uh, make this an open discussion in the sitting rooms, in homes, uh, to, be, to enable people to be discussing this when they are on their way from and to church, to, be able to discuss about this on their way to traditional engagements, cultural involvements, because that's where this is being silenced. That's where the breeding uh, area for uh, 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 socialization is being enhanced and we are counteracting that process. So we, 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 we need to get to that area whereby this is a topic of the sitting rooms in ordinary homes not in homes where the, the people have you know, access to information. So if we cannot be having this conversation in our deep rural areas, 
where we need everybody to be on board. It's only information in those who are, 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 are having access to information, you know, then it's, it's, it's still a challenge for a while. So my question is, um, do we have mechanisms in place that we can use to assess impact of these kind of engagements that we are busy with? Because without assessing the impact, we will never know as to whether we are winning or we are, are not winning, we are on the same place. And, 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 and I'm saying we, because I don't think this is the responsibility of one person, it's the responsibility for us all to say, do we have mechanism that we can put in place to say, yes, we are here, we were here, and then look into all the age cohorts. Because if we are going to focus on the youth and we leave out the women of my age and the women above my age, then those are the very influential people to our youth. So we need to make sure that when we do our assessment, we start and involve all of them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Uh, Yvonne's raised a very important issue without using the word culture. So when we are faced with things like we want to call somebody out or speak out about something and somebody says, but that's the culture, how do we respond? Do we respond by saying, right, culture can change, it's fluid, and what you're talking about is sexist culture. But I'm going to ask um, Gerki and Nalu and Linda to please respond to what Yvonne commented on. Thanks very much. Can we have that in that order? Nalu, Gerki and Linda, thanks. Thanks, Prof. I'm just going to touch uh, on not everything that Yvonne uh, has shared, but I'm just going to touch on, uh, on certain aspects. I think uh, the first one where she mentioned is around mentoring. And uh, in my experience, uh, I've had good mentors and I, I do see the value of, uh, of mentoring, but I think it's time as women within those spaces to expand mentoring even a step further to, uh, to being uh, our sister's keeper, because sometimes we can also be part of the problem as women. You, uh, you find women uh, who get into this space and adopt uh, the behaviors or the so-called limiting behaviors that uh, men adopt and uh, they impose that uh, on other women and create spaces that aren't, uh, that aren't comfortable for, for other women. So for me, beyond mentoring, uh, while it's well, well, good and fair to have a mentor, Beyond mentoring, I think as women in those spaces, we all have a responsibility to lift, uh, lift as we rise and, uh, and be our sister's keeper. On the second option, which she, uh, which she has addressed on how do we uh, encourage uh, young girls to, uh, to get into the spaces or to have an interest uh, in technology, it's a very valid question. And I always say around the work that I do with kids in terms of teaching them how to code, I, I always say I'm not creating the next generation of computer scientists. In fact, I don't want uh, all these kids to be computer scientists. All I'm planting is a seed of professionals, whether they are accountants one day or lawyers, are professionals who are able to think digitally and who are able to, to apply uh, digital, uh, digital solutions. So when we want women in, in, in the tech space or within the fourth IR space, we're not looking for a uniform approach of this woman needs to look like this, this woman all needs to code. And I was quite deliberate when I started by making a reference to how I entered uh, what she called this, uh, the industry. And the industry has transformed so beautifully now that there's space even uh, in the fourth IR for, for, for the creatives, for the artists, stuff that we didn't necessarily embrace before. Because uh, I know from my own family, if I were to, uh, to wake up and say, uh, I want to go study art, my family would frown at me and, uh, and uh, not understand. So uh, what is important is exposing young girls. That's, what, that, that, that's, that's the work we need to do. 
expose young girls to, uh, to the world of opportunities and what is available, whether they, they choose to be in the spaces or not, we can't, we can't be running a numbers game where we're pushing to have so many women uh, within, within the space. It's not a numbers game because you want to have women who are, who are passionate and who, who are vested in, in the space and not uh, people who just want to, to be part of the space. And those are some of the uncomfortable conversations we need to have uh, as women in the, in, in the space, transforming from uh, being a quota of statistics into, into having an impact in the space and uh, for women to do what they love. Thanks so much, Lolly. Yeah, we are not numbers and we are not playing numbers games. And definitely we have to be our sister's keepers. Thanks so much for that. Geki? Yes, I, I really agree with what Sis Nolbuyo is saying. Uh, so yes, absolutely. I think I'll just add two things that struck me as if one was speaking. The one was, and, and you mentioned it as well, Glenda, the issue of culture. I think it's really important to recognize that technology simply layers onto a societal condition or a societal culture. It's not a culture in and of itself. Uh, and so if we seek to use technology to make more efficient, negative, toxic hierarchies and relationships and um, sort of attitudes that we hold, then yes, technology can help us do that very well, if that's the intention. However, if we believe that what we want to do is to use technology to help transform in a direction that we actively want to go that's different from where we are right now, we can also do that. Uh, but that choice is one we have to be very conscious of. So I think it's really important. And, and in a way, I want to also use that to comment on the question Kamantha is asking about how do we get girls interested in tech? And this is why I was really uh, agreeing with Sis Noluvuyo, is a friend of mine, Riel from UNESCO, often says that um, you know, nobody ever asks people to be an expert in knives but we may want to cook. Uh, so nobody asks how many of you are experts in forging mm -hmm. knives, in understanding the technology behind knives or anything like that. But we understand that it's a tool uh, and what's important is what you're using it for. And you can use it negatively, you can use it positively. You can even decide not to use it at all, but you understand what you lose out on <laughs> by not using it. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps as simple as that sounds, we need to understand that technology is in some way similar. I don't think you inspire many girls to go into tech by selling tech. I think you get people to understand that the issues they do care about uh, actually are exactly, you know, can be advanced, can be achieved through various applications in tech, and you can decide what dimensions and aspects of tech would do that, but that does require some basic level of digital literacy. So I think we've got to change from trying to sell, even STEM sometimes, I think, you know, selling people science for the sake of it, or math for the sake of it, perhaps is not tactically the best way to get uh, girls interested in something. I think we have to allow people to understand that their passions can be pursued in various ways. And as the world changes, there's some basics you just need. Yes. Thanks, Geki. That's great because you're overlapping with what Nalu said, which is exposure is very important. We don't have to become the best geeks in town, but we need exposure. We need access. We need broadband, you know, all that sort of thing. We need the skills, the technology, the, the, the platforms, the equipment, all that sort of thing. And somehow we do learn by osmosis as well. Okay, Linda, can we have you next? We're going to wrap up in two minutes. So Linda will be our last, our last speaker. Uh, last yeah. to, to note, to wrap up, what is your takeaway point from this and what would you like to share? Okay, so I'd like to 100% agree and with what the two speakers spoke about before. Um, I'll say we've had several sessions where we started off by using Facebook and every child now uses Facebook, but for some reason they did not understand that that is technology. So we've had several sessions where we just use Facebook and we, we, we had a session with um, uh, a catering school and basically we were just trying to let them know that um, you can use technology to improve your, your vocational skills. And so I think one thing we can also do to um, get more girls interested in, in STEM as, as a whole is to see how they can relate it to their lives. Um, the things that they do on a day-to-day -day basis, the STEM, the, the technology that they use to solve their day-to-day -day problems 
how they can use technology to solve a problem that they see in their communities. Um, at the moment, my organization, um, we are building, um, the girls actually are creating biodegradable face masks for their for their communities and we have another group um coming together with their own um, first aid kits using 3d printers for low-income communities so basically what we do is we we make them understand first of all identify a problem that they face every day in their communities and then we go through a problem solving um, um, session and then they come up with ways that they think we can solve those problems and based on that, we can see what we can use, the tools that we can use and the resources that we can use to solve those problems. So it's not just about telling them that technology or STEM is something that they have to be involved in, but you let them be part of it. Let them know that they, they use it every day in their, in their lives. And when you do that, it makes it, basically it demystifies the whole, science and technology uh, concept to them and it's easy for them to be part of it. Absolutely correct. In other words, it's not something out there. It's already demystified because you're on your smartphone and you are doing WhatsApp and you are on Facebook and you are tweeting and you're doing Instagram pictures. So you are doing technology. Exactly. And that's such an important point to remind people about. It's not just about coding computers or something. Um, thank you very much, everyone. This was most inspiring. Can we just all give a nice, unmute yourselves, give a nice big clap to our panelists. And I'm going to look at the program again. To see if it is. Uh, to see if there's anything else on the program or perhaps half done, you can let me know where is the program. I think these are actually the closing remarks, the remarks that everyone's made and after the question and answer session. And I thank you all for attending. Um, yes, so thanks so much.